What's up my pre-calc people? Michael Princhuk here, ready for another video for AP Pre-Calculus. In this video, we're gonna to tackle topic 1.2, rates of change. Understanding rates of change of a function is a really important topic because it's a big, huge concept overall in pre-calculus as well as calculus. So, in this video, we're gonna talk about two really important types of ways that we could look at the rate of change. We could look at the average rate of change between two points, which is also the average rate of change over an interval from A to B, but we can also look at the rate of change at a point. So let's dive right into it and make sure that you leave this video understanding all of it. First up, let's talk about the average rate of change over an interval of a function. Now here's the official definition that you might find in the curriculum for AP Pre-Calculus, and it can be a little bit wordy, a little bit confusing, but at the end of the day, just remember, the average rate of change is the ratio of your change of outputs to your change of inputs over that interval. Now, perhaps it might even be easier to say that the average rate of change over an interval from A to B is just taking the ratio, the fraction of the change of the outputs divided by the change of the inputs. Now, we actually have a cool way of saying that. Um, mathematically, we call this the change of Y over the change of X. Now, the mathematical symbol for change is the Greek letter delta, which looks like a triangle. So we say delta y over delta x. All we're saying here is that the average rate of change is the change of your y's, your output values, divided by the change of your x's, which are your input values. We can even take a look at a graph here to really fully understand exactly what we're looking at here. So we have a function, and that function, and we're gonna you know, take an interval of that function from a to b. And A has an output, F of A, and B has an output, F of B. So the average rate of change over this interval from A to B would be looking at the ratio of the outputs divided by the inputs. So that's simply going to be looking at the difference of our outputs, F of B minus F of A, divided by the ratio, or divided by the change in our inputs, excuse me, B minus A. Now this is a very simple form that you guys have probably been working with since maybe seventh grade or eighth grade when you first started talking about slope of a line, but here we're looking at the rate of change, because functions aren't all lines, right? They could go up and down and curve around, all that fun stuff. So the idea is very simple. We have a function, we have two points on that function. Point A, point B. A has an output, F of A. B has an output, F of B. And if we connect those two points, we have a line. We call this a secant line, okay? A line that crosses these two points, and we want to find the average rate of change of these two points, is finding the slope or the rate of change of the secant line that connects them. And all we got to do to find the rate of change of a line is take the difference of our outputs divided by the difference of our inputs. So that's it. That's how easy it is to find the average rate of change of an interval on a function. Get your two points, input, output, second point, input, output, and find the slope of the line, which we call the secant line, that would connect them. Now let's look at a couple of examples to see how easy this is to actually do. In this first example, we're asked to consider the function 2x squared minus 5, and we want to find the average rate of change from x equals negative 1 to x equals 5. Well, the first thing we need are points at negative 1 and the other point at 5. So we take negative 1, plug it into our function to get negative 3, take 5, plug it into our function to get 45, and then all we got to do to find the average rate of change is take our outputs, 45 minus negative 3, subtract them on top, take our inputs, find the difference, 5 minus negative 1 on the bottom, make sure we do all that math right, because most kids actually the biggest mistakes are just doing some simple math wrong, so make sure you're very careful with that math, and we get 48 over 6, which is 8. So the average rate of change between these two points is 8, or the slope of the secant line connecting these two points is 8. Here's another example where we are looking at the function the square root of 2x minus 3 and we're asked to find the average rate of change over the interval 6 to 14. So that's x equals 6 to x equals 14. So the first thing we need are the points. So we're going to plug in 6, we get 3, plug in 14 and get 5. Now that we have the two points at the end of this interval, in the beginning and the end of the interval, we can then find the average rate of change by just finding the change in y on top, 5 minus 3, divided by the change in x in the bottom, 14 minus 6, and we get 2 over 8 or 1 fourth. I can't stress enough, make sure you're doing the math correct and make sure that you're subtracting, you're not accidentally adding by mistake or forgetting a negative sign, and you gotta make sure that the y's are on top. A lot of kids will put the x's on top, we don't wanna mess that up. And then also make sure that you're doing it in the same order. So if I'm going output five minus output three, I gotta do that same order for the input, input 14 minus input six. 
All right, we can also find the average rate of change by looking at a table of values. Now, maybe we don't have the actual function, but we have a table, numerical table, right? So to find the average rate of change over the interval negative 1 to 9, so again, we're looking at an x value of negative 1 to an x value of 9, what is the average rate of change between those two points? First thing I need, of course, are the points. I'm just going to use the table to find them. Negative 1, the output is 10. 9, the output is negative 9. And now I'm just going to subtract. Output negative 9 minus output 10 divided by input 9 minus input negative 1. And I get negative 19 over 10 for my rate of change. All right, we could also find the average rate of change if we have a graph in front of us. We just got to look at the graph to get our points. So here's a graph. We want to find the average rate of change from negative 4 to 2. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at that graph. We're going to find the actual points. At negative 4, we are at 5. At 2, we are at negative 2. So I got my two points. And then I'm just going to find the rate of change between them, the change of y divided by the change of x. Again, that's delta y on top, the change of my y is divided by delta x on the bottom, the change of my x's. You guys get it. And we get negative 7, 6. Overall, not too bad. Now, the next thing I really want to emphasize is that the average rate of change on functions can change, meaning between two points, it might be one rate of change, and between another two points, we might have a different rate of change. So if we actually go back to that graph that we just looked at, and we say, all right, let's find the average rate of change from two to four. So look at there, I put dots at two and four, so we got two comma negative two, we got four comma zero. I drew the secant line that connects those two points, and then we could find the average rate of change between those two points. Now, we notice that the rate of change of that line is, is positive, which makes sense. And again, we could actually find the value of it if we wanted to. But the point is, we could also pick another two points. So here are another two points. They're not so perfect, but they're uh, red point to red point, right? And I connected those two red points with a green line. So the average rate of change between those two red points would be different than the average rate of change between the original two black points. All you got to do is look at the two secant lines. The blue secant line definitely has a different slope than the green secant line. They're both positive, but the green secant line is going to have a higher rate of change. It's, it's steeper. We all know that. So the point is, is if we have two different rates of change because of two different points or sets of points, then we can compare the average rate of change between them. Maybe this change is negative and this change is positive. This one's more steep, this one's less steep. You get the idea, but that's something to understand is that you're not always going to get the same average rate of change for every single function. Now, the last thing I want to mention when it comes to average rate of change is the average rate of change is exactly that. It's the average rate of change over that interval. So think of it as like a per unit price. Right? So if the average rate of change over an interval is 6, but that interval is 2 units wide, then that's 6 for each of those units. That's an overall change of 12. Let me give you one more example of that. If the average rate of change is 5, but the interval we're going to look at goes from 6 to 10, well, that is an interval of 4, and for every one of the units, it's a change of 5, an average rate of change of 5. So that's a total change of 20 over that interval. Hopefully that makes sense. We could also analyze the rate of change at a point. point. Now this could be a little bit tricky because at a point, a function's actually not changing. There is no change at a single point. We just got done talking about average rate of change, which you have two points. And you could have a rate of change or an average rate of change between two points. But it's hard to understand having a rate of change at a single point. But here's how we actually define it. The rate of change of a function at a point quantifies the rate at which the output would change if the input would change at this point. Now listen, I know that that's a little bit weird, a little bit confusing, so let me do my best to explain. We actually cannot find the rate of change at a single point with what we have already. We are going to need some fairly advanced calculus to figure this out, but that's actually what this class is setting you up for. So here's what we're going to do. The rate of change at a point can be approximated by finding the average rate of change between two points on a smaller and smaller interval that contain the point we're trying to find the rate of change at. Now, if you're still like, okay, what the heck are you talking about? Bear with me. I'm going to show you a couple of examples, and we're going to take a look at a picture that's going to make it a lot easier to understand. So the idea is I want to find the rate of change at this single point, x comma f of x. I want to find the rate of change, not between two points, that's an average rate of change. I want to find the rate of change at this point. Well, what I can do is first draw what we call the tangent line. The tangent line would be the line that only touches our function at that one point, like we're seeing in the picture here, the blue line. And the rate of change, the slope of that blue line, is exactly what I'm after. 
but how do I find the rate of change of a line when I only have one point? It's actually impossible. If you remember from algebra, you need two points to find the average rate of change. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have us think about a second point that is slid over a little bit. So we have point x, and we're going to find a second point that's h units away. So we're going to take that first x, and we're going to move it over h units. So that second point becomes x plus h. So now we have two points, x comma f of x, and our second point, h units over, would be x plus h, with an output of f of x plus h. Now this is not the tangent line, this is the secant line that we just got done talking about, where we could find the average rate of change. So the average rate of change would just be taking the output, f of x plus h, minus the other output, f of x, divided by my subtraction of my inputs, x plus h, minus x. Now, in the denominator, you're going to notice those x's are going to cancel. A positive x and negative x make a 0, so I just get h. But that actually, actually makes sense because h is the change of my x's. First s was x, first x was x, the second was x plus h, that's a change of h. Now, this formula is actually pretty cool because this is known as the difference quotient. It's a pretty powerful formula when you move into calculus. Now, here's the idea that I'm trying to get at. If I want to find the rate of change at point x only, what I have to do is start off with a point close to it, x plus h away. Okay, great. And then I'm going to find the average rate of change of that secant line. Now, that's not going to be the rate of change at x. It's, it's close, but it's not exactly the tangent line I'm after. But if I simply make h smaller, which would basically slide my second point closer to my first point, then what I get is a better approximation. So that's kind of what the definition is saying to you. You're not going to be able to find the rate of change at x, but we can approximate the rate of change at x if we look at the average rate of change over smaller and smaller intervals containing that point. So the closer I move that second point into my first point, that means I'm making h smaller and smaller, the better and better the approximation will be for what the rate of change at point x is. So essentially to find the rate of change at x, I need to analyze the average rate of change between x and a point really, really close to it. And the closer I make that second point to my first point, the better the approximation will be. Let's take a look at an example so you can actually see how this plays out. Okay, let's take a look at this function and explore the rate of change at x equals 2. Okay, so the function is 2x squared minus 3x, and I want to find the rate of change at 2. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pick some h values. Again, so I need my first point, which is at 2 comma 2. If I take 2 and I plug it in, I get 2. Okay, so on the left here we see that I'm going to take an h value of 2. So that, that would be an h value two units away. So if my first point is 2 comma 2, the second point would be at 4, two units away, and then the output for 4 is 20. So the average rate of change between these two points is 9. Okay, so that's not a bad approximation, but it's certainly not perfect. So if we make the h value smaller, so let's say we make the h value 1, so now we're going to just slide over to 3. So now we have our first point, 2 comma 2, we have the second point, 3 comma 9, and then we're going to find the average rate of change between these two points, we get 7. So because that h value, the distance between my point that I'm trying to find the rate of change at and the next point is smaller, that's a better approximation. And I can even make that even better. So let's lower h even smaller. So that second point is only going to be 0.5 away. So first point, 2 comma 2. Second point, 2.5 comma 5. Average rate of change between those two points is 6. All right, let's get even closer. First point, 2 comma 2. Second point is only 0 0.007 away. So my input, 2.007. Output, 2.035098. The average rate of change between these two points is 5.014. So now my average rate of change is getting closer and closer and closer to what the actual rate of change at 2 is. And finally, I can get super close, right? So now my second point is 0 0.0000004 away, right? So my first point is still 2 comma 2. My second point is really, really, really close. And if I find the average rate of change between these two points, I just get 5. So what is the average rate of change at 2? Well, my best approximation, as I got really, 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 really close to 2, would be 5.
Hopefully that makes sense. I know it's a little bit tricky, but the idea is we can't find the average rate of change at a single point. You need two points to find an average rate of change. So to find the rate of change at a point, we just got to keep getting a second point that's really darn close. And the closer we get, the better the approximation will be. All right, now that we have a little bit, I hope, better understanding of the rate of change at a point, we can actually learn about some characteristics that the rate of change at a point tells us. So first, a positive rate of change at a point tells us that at that point, the function is increasing. Because if we draw that tangent line at that point, then that tangent line is going to be going up, which means at that point, the function is also going up. So here we actually see that in a picture form here. So I have two points that I emphasized in red, and I drew in the rate of change, the, the tangent line, at those two points. And we see that both of them would have positive rates of change. And at both of those red points, those are intervals where the function is increasing. On the red point on the left, that, at that point, the function is definitely increasing. And then even the red point on the right-hand side, the function is also increasing. Now, they're increasing at different rates. That's the other thing I definitely want you to see here. They're both positive lines, yes, but how they're increasing are very different. The one on the left has a little bit of a steeper slope than the one on the right. Now, so basically when we say that the rate of change is positive, we, we, we infer that at the point the function is increasing. So something to keep in uh, mind there. Now, a negative rate of change simply means that if you have a negative rate of change at a single point, the rate of change at that point is negative. That means you're decreasing. The function is decreasing at that point. So we can actually see that in the same picture as well. So here I drew two red dots and I drew the tangent lines, the rate of changes at those points, and we see that the rate of change are both negative. That's because in the interval containing those two red points, the function is decreasing. So when we say that the rate of change is negative, we infer that at that point, the function is decreasing. All right, that's it for topic 1.2. A pretty short topic, but a really, really important one. You have to make sure you understand the two different types of change that we can analyze. The average rate of change between two points, really simple. We connect those two points, we call it a secant line, and we simply find the slope of that secant line, which is just the change of y over change of x. That's pretty simple and easy to do. And then the rate of change at a point is finding that point, creating the tangent line, and then finding the slope or the rate of change of that tangent line. But but again, as I mentioned already, you can't find the rate of change with a single point. So that's why we have to approximate it by bringing in a second point. And the closer we bring that second point in, the better the approximation gets for the rate of change at a single point. But more importantly is just understanding what the rate of change looks like at a single point and how if it's positive, we're increasing at that point, And if it's negative, we're decreasing at that point. All right, that's it for topic 1.2. See you in the next video.